share board. There we go. So know that this webinar is being recorded um, and you'll be able to find the recording on YouTube and in the Community Science Long Island webpage. So um, my name is Jimena Perez Vizcasillas. I am the Outreach Coordinator for the Long Island Sound Study Estuary Program and I am with New York Sea Grant. I am joined this evening by Ariel Santos, the Policy Program Coordinator at CTUC. Um, Sally Kellogg, Program Implementation Specialist at the South Shore Estuary Reserve. Valerie Vergona, um, the Outreach Coordinator of the Peconic Estuary Partnership. And I'm excited to introduce our panelists today um, who are here from uh, the Atlantic Marine Conservation Society, or AMCs. We have Allison DePerdy, uh, the Research Associate and Field Biologist with AMCs, and Ali Saiwak, uh, a stranding response and education apprentice with AMCs. Uh, the last thing I'll say is if you have any questions during uh, any of these presentations, please feel free to either put them in the chat or put them down there in the Q&A box. Um, and at the end of this session, we'll uh, have a chance for our speakers to answer those. So uh, without further ado, Ali, take it away. Thank you so much. I'm gonna try, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, I'm going to try and share my screen. Okay, how's that look? Looks great. All right. Just a second, sorry, that was not the right. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna go with that. Does that look okay? Yep, we're seeing the title slide. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you so much, Amena and uh, team for inviting us to talk about sea turtles of New York. Um, I am Allison DePerdy with Atlantic Marine Conservation Society. I have been uh, fortunate enough to be working in the marine mammal and sea turtle response and research community in New York for uh, about 20 years now. And, um, it's just been a great passion of mine. And I'm always so inspired by working with all of um, our partners. Um, so I'm happy to talk about sea turtles today. Um, I wanna thank our wonderful sponsors um, and supporters and partners, uh, Mystic Aquariums, Marine Animal Response Program, um, Group for the East End, uh, TD Bank, Long Island Community Foundation, Citizens Campaign, of course, New York Sea Grant, um, and the uh, South Shore Estuary Reserve and Peconic uh, Estuary Program. So today we wanted to just give you a little more information on Atlantic Marine Conservation Society and the species of sea turtles that you might see in New York. And we wanted to talk about a phenomenon that is actually just starting now in um, New York waters called cold stunning and let you know how you can help these animals um, while they're in our waters. So Atlantic Marine Conservation Society is a nonprofit organization and we promote marine conservation through action. And how we do that includes interacting with our public uh, and community partners while we are responding to seal, sea turtles, dolphins, and whales that wash up in New York waters um, and examining them to find out why they died, what um, threats they're facing in our waters. And we also conduct research to um, examine the, I'm sorry, we conduct research programs to examine the wild populations of these animals and um, find find correlations to why these animals might be stranding versus what the um, wild populations are doing. Now we can't do any of that work alone. It takes a lot of people to um, conduct our work. So we work with Marine Patrol and a lot of municipal partners to respond to all of these animals. In the top, I think right of your screen, you can see our stranding program coordinator, Kimberly Durham, with a minke whale that stranded in East Hampton, working with the East Hampton Marine Patrol to uh, respond to that animal. 
we have uh, volunteers and interns in the middle and top left corner who help in all aspects of our work, including the stranding response um, and patient care at our critical care facility in West Hampton. The most important um, aspect of our work revolves around our public outreach because all of the community members who use our local beaches are often the first to find these stranded animals. So we conduct beach cleanups and um, we work with local school groups to do uh, collect data on the beach cleanups to um, monitor for cold sending, which we'll talk to you about a little later, and just really uh, teaching everyone what they can do to be uh, environmental stewards. Of course, it's not moving now. There we go. So we're talking about sea turtles today. I'm wondering how many out of the seven sea turtles that you see on your screen right here do you think that we can see in New York? And then are, is there a way to do a, a poll or um, questions in the chat or you want me to just keep going? They should be able to put a number in the chat. I don't know if I can launch a poll right now, but. Oh, no, folks, no, no, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, folks, put, put a, guess a number in the chat. <laughs> yeah, we're seeing three, five, four, question mark, three, all of them, seven, three. <laughs> Thank you. We are um, fortunate enough to see four out of these seven sea turtle species in New York waters, which is pretty amazing. Um, the three that we don't actually see in these parts are the flatback sea turtle, which is a species of sea turtle found in Australia, the olive ridley sea turtle, which is a west coast species um, and is often seen um, in the southern area of Mexico and uh, south um, the southern U.S. And then the hawksbill sea turtle right here is also a species that is a, a Caribbean sea turtle. We have probably seen a few sea turtle, uh, hawksbill sea turtles over the years in, in these waters, but um, they're not regular visitors. So talking about the regular visitors that we see here, um, the Atlantic green sea turtle is the largest of the hard shell turtles that we see here, gets to be about um, four feet long from the tip of their uh, shell right here to the bottom. And actually, let me see if you guys need to see, hopefully you can see a pointer. Um, they're characterized, um, one of the great characteristics of these sea turtles is these um, beautiful scoots on their shell um, or these separations and the starburst pattern that you see here. So that beautiful pattern on their shell is a um, identifying feature of these animals. And really interesting fact um, about Atlantic green sea turtles is that they are vegetarians when they're adults. So they eat all of this vegetation that you see on the bottom of this picture um, and all of the chlor chlorophyll in the um, greens that they eat actually turns the fat in their body green. So that's how they got their name. We also see leather uh, loggerhead sea turtles, which are um, just slightly smaller than the Atlantic green sea turtle. They get to be about three, three and a half feet long and about 300 pounds. Um, they are slowly becoming a predominant species of sea turtle that we see in New York waters. And um, they are crab or crustacean specialists. So they really uh, enjoy eating a lot of the um, animals with hard shells. Um, they also eat some schooling fish and uh, we have seen their numbers increasing in the stranding records, but also in sightings around Long Island in the last five or six years. We have Kemp's Ridley sea turtles in our waters, which is the most endangered sea turtle in the oceans. And they're also the smallest of the hard shell turtles that we see in this area. They only get to be about one to two feet, uh, one and a half to two feet long when they're adults. And they weigh about 150 pounds. So that's not a big turtle at all. Um, and they are endangered because for a long time, the Kemp's Ridley sea turtles um, only nested 
the only known nesting habitat for them was on a small stretch of beach in Rancho Nuevo, Mexico. And unfortunately, habitat degradation and poaching and predators um, caused a lot of problems for these turtles. And so um, scientists started to transplant their um, nests. So they excavated the nests and they transplanted them to a couple different locations um, along the coast of Texas. And um, those nesting sites are starting to be uh, populated again. So when female sea turtles um, hatch out of the nests, they go into the ocean, they become adult turtles, and eventually they'll go back to the same nesting area um, that they were hatched at to lay their eggs. So um, we are hopefully seeing a, an increase in the Kemps Ridley sea turtle population due to those um, re-nesting efforts. Uh, Kemp's Ridley sea turtles are also crustacean specialists. You can see that they have this hook on their beak um, and sea turtle, the, the three sea turtles that we just talked about, their beaks are actually um, hard kind of keratin, just like your fingernails. Um, and this hook over here helps them to uh, crush the crustaceans or crabs that they like to eat. We also see leatherback sea turtles, which are the largest um, species of sea turtle we see in these waters. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, they are known to be very, very big. They get to be about six feet long and their wingspan of their flippers is about six feet long, uh, wide, I guess. And they are, um, they grow to be, be about 1,000 to 1,500 pounds. So this characteristic ridge along their shell, which is also not a hard shell like the other turtles, but a soft leathery skin covering over their uh, scoots is um, the, the thing they're known for. Now these sea turtles get their, they get that big by eating jellyfish, which is pretty crazy because jellyfish are really small. So they have to eat a lot. Um, so here is a map of strandings for sea turtles on Long Island. And as you can see, there's uh, not really any place you cannot see sea turtles in Long Island. Uh, a lot of the leatherback or loggerhead sea turtle strandings you see in the recent years have been concentrating on the uh, Western Long Island. And we've been seeing a lot more um, sub-adult and adult uh, loggerhead sea turtles in this area. And then a lot of the sea turtle strandings you see on the North shore around the Long Island Sound are um, often cold sunned animals, which Ellie is gonna talk about in just a couple minutes. So some of the human or anthropogenic threats that these animals face while they're in our waters include uh, environmental disasters like the uh, Deepwater Horizon oil spill in 2010, um, Vessel strikes and vessel interactions um, are a big issue, especially for loggerhead sea turtles in recent years, but all um, of the sea turtle species in New York are, um, pro are, are susceptible to this issue. Marine debris ingestion is a really um, big problem in sea turtles. Um, we were examining in, I believe 2018, this leatherback sea turtle. Um, that had washed ashore dead on a beach in Southampton. And this is a photo of one of our biologists who is measuring the tail of the sea turtle um, to get an estimate of um, the age of the turtle. Um, when male turtles are uh, adults, they actually, their tail grows long, uh, very long past the bottom of their shell um, because they use their tail uh, for mating. So that's uh, one of the ways you can tell if a sea turtle, a male sea turtle is mature. So anyway, um, during this exam, we unfortunately found uh, a large 15 gallon trash bag, some small plastic pieces and a food wrapper in this animal's stomach. Um, and that animal is not alone, unfortunately. So we have seen a lot of um, marine debris being ingested by sea turtles um, that wash ashore on our beaches and our network partners are seeing that as well up and down the coast. Um, another issue that uh, sea turtles face are fisheries interaction, including entanglement in fishing gear, um, hook and swallowing hooks um, from recreational gear, 
uh, these animals are opportunistic <laughs> feeders when they want to be. So uh, sometimes they are looking to to eat all of eat off of the um, the hooks that people are looking to catch fish with. So um, definitely a big issue. I'm going to stop now and let Ellie um, speak, and we can take a couple questions if you want, or we can save the questions for the end. What do you think, Jimena? Um, I'm not seeing any questions, so maybe um, I think Ellie can go ahead. Okay, that sounds good. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and while Ellie is preparing um, her section, I can also mention that um, one of the participants today is our executive director, Rob T. Giovanni. So um, if he, we have any questions at the end, he might be able to help us answer them if we need. Okay, well, now it's my turn. Um, as Amanda said at the beginning of the presentation, my name is Ellie Siwak. I am a stranding and educational outreach apprentice um, for AMCs. I started with them this past March as a volunteer and then applied for the apprenticeship uh, because I've always had a passion for marine biology and our environment and um, wanted to get back into this field. Um, we did have a question, should we answer it now or wait till the end? I just saw it. Um, if it's if it's quick, you you feel free to answer it. Yeah, I can I can help. The question that I just saw pop up in the chat is: Are there any industrial runoff issues in Long Island that affect sea turtles? Um, so that's kind of a complex question, but the short answer is yes. Um, in general, uh runoff issues in Long Island include um, nitrogen that seeps into our waters, which can um, cause harmful algal blooms and um, just a, a lot of different algal blooms, which could uh, affect the animal's ability to uh, gain, to, to find their food. Um, so that could definitely be an issue. Um, any, I don't know of any specific runoff issues that are, um, a problem at this point. Um, but if you think about runoff in a, a different light too, all of the marine debris that ends up in our storm drains usually ends up in the, um, marine areas in this, um, region. So that could be a big issue too, about marine debris, um, getting into the waterways. Thanks. Thanks, Sally. We have another question, but we'll leave that one for the end. Go ahead, Ellie. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that you can see. Okay, great. So I am talking about the reason for the season, which is cold stunning. Um, what is cold stunning? So as you may know, sea turtles, along with Land turtles are cold blooded reptiles and they depend on which means they depend on the temperature of their surroundings to maintain their body temperature. So they normally control their body temperature when they're in the water by swimming between areas of water with different temperatures, they find a warm patch, they bask in the sun at the water surface. In some places in the world and not around Long Island, but in some places in the world, they even um, come out of the water onto the beach to bask in the sun. However, when temperatures rapidly decline and sea turtles are cut off from moving to warmer waters, they can suffer from a form of hypothermia we call cold stunning. So we typically see sea turtles in our waters from late June to September. And that is the time when they, the water here is warm enough for them to live peacefully and without health issues. Um, but as the temperature in the air declines, the water temperature will follow and the sea turtles may not be receiving the signals from their environment, they may, may not be able to get out in time. Um, so when a particularly cold cold snap happens, or the water temperature finally dips below around 50 degrees Fahrenheit, um, that is when sea turtles become hypothermic or cold stunned. Um, it can be fatal for them as the sea turtles become lethargic, they experience decreased circulation and their body functions slow down. Cold stunned sea turtles are more likely to be hit by boats, they're more vulnerable to predators. They can become sick. Um, they can even die as their bodies shut down. They can have pneumonia. 
Um, so this makes strong cold snaps and unseasonably cooler weather serious business for these sea turtles. Um, cold stem season typically begins around late October and continues through the end of December. Um, we have just started to see the first cold stunned sea turtles. Um, we've been getting word from our stranding partners in New England. Um, I heard today that the New York Marine Rescue Center has brought in a couple sea turtles to their facility this week. Um, so the water now is finally cold enough for when we do our beach walks, you might find a real sea turtle and not in a plastic model that I've hidden in the rack line. Um, Cold stunning can happen to all four of the species of sea turtles that Allie talked about. It is less likely to happen with leatherbacks just because of their sheer size. They're able to withstand more um, temperature variations. Um, so we see cold stunned greens, Kemp's Ridleys, and loggerheads. Um, and we can help them. Um, there's a variety of ways. We can do it by monitoring the beaches. Um, and we can do it by saving the New York State Stranding hotline in our phone, which is very small on this slide and will be much bigger on a slide in the future, so just hang tight. Um, this is a map of the stranded cold stun sea turtles from November 2017 to December 2022. The red areas are places where sea turtles strand and were found to be cold stunned more frequently. So you can see it's on a lot of north facing beaches. When a sea turtle cold stuns out in the water, um, they are, if they're lucky, they're pushed by the wind and by the tide into shore um, southward. And so that's why you're finding them on north facing beaches because luckily Long Island is right there to catch them as the wind and the tide push them south. Um, we, as Ali said at the beginning, we could not do the work that we do without members of the public and we rely heavily on members of the public to be the ones monitoring our beaches. Um, I love a good winter beach walk, so I assume that everybody else does, and we want to make sure as many people as possible are aware that we have cold stunned sea turtles that may wash ashore and what they can do to help them if they encounter one. So we have a, pro a cold stunned beach monitor protocol. Um, first off, before you go, you want to check the tides and determine the best time to walk the beach. Um, I like to say that there's two best times to walk the beach. The first being anytime you can, um, because you never know when a sea turtle is going to be out there and in need of help. And you may be the only person walking the beach that day. Um, but the second best time to walk the beach, if you want to plan it a little more scientifically, is just after high tide. Because if you think about it, the water and the wind have just pushed that turtle all the way up with the high tide. And as the water declines, as it ebbs away, the sea turtle is left behind. And as soon as a sea turtle is deposited basically on a beach, it's like a clock starts. That sea turtle is just going to get colder because of the wind and exposure to the elements. So we wanna make sure that people are out there as soon as possible after high tide so that any sea turtles that were washed in with the high tide can be found quickly and rehabilitated. Um, you wanna check the weather and dress appropriately. We don't want you getting cold stunned. Uh, it's important to bring gloves and a reusable bag uh, we encourage everyone to make every beach walk, every time they go to the beach, uh, a beach cleanup of their own. As Ali showed you earlier, uh, marine debris is a huge problem for sea turtles. And so whenever you're walking the beach, if you have a way to pick up and take away any debris that you may find, that's a good day. That's a good beach walk. Um, we have a data sheet for marine debris that we can uh, send out. Um, that we encourage, or you can just keep track via app on your phone. I know there's a couple apps to keep track of marine debris as you're doing beach walks. Um, that's the kind of data that scientists use to enact change. So plastic bag bans in grocery stores or encouraging Starbucks to change the shapes of their lids so that they don't use as many straws or um, you know, banning balloon releases from beaches. Collecting data on the debris we're finding on the beach supports changes like that. Um, after you do a beach walk, you want to report your location, the start and end time of your walk, the distance you've covered, the weight of marine debris collected. Um, you can scan, scan or send a photo of your data sheet to education at amcs.org. Um, and we will log that beach cleanup and add your debris to our spreadsheet where we collect data on what kind of debris is being picked up on the beach. Um, 
you're going to find a lot of marine debris in the rack line or the high tide line. So that line you see along the beach, that's a lot of reeds. It looks like straw or hay. Um, that's what the water has pushed up and left behind. You're going to find a lot of marine debris there. And that is also where you're most likely to find a cold stunned sea turtle. So you want to have sharp eyes while you're looking because they may be hidden under debris. They may be upside down. They may be half buried in the sand. Um, if you encounter an animal, unfortunately, your beach cleanup is now over. It is now about saving that animal. And you should assume every animal is alive as long as it has a head. Um, so if you find a sea turtle, this is the most important thing you can do. Call the New York Strait Stranding Hotline. It's in big red letters and numbers on the screen. Um, I would highly encourage you to put this in your phone right now. Don't think you'll remember at the end. It's here in front of you right now. So do it right now. You can save it as whatever you want. You can save it as Sea Turtle Rescue. You can save it as New York State Stranding Hotline. You can save it as AMCs. But if you ever find a stranded marine mammal or sea turtle, this is the number you're going to want to call. Um, you want to have your location ready, your latitude and longitude if possible, your name and contact phone number and a rough estimate of the size of the turtle because that helps rehabilitators figure out how big of a team to send. You know, Ali said that loggerheads can get up to 300 pounds. That is a more than one person operation. Um, so the rescuers will need to know how big a turtle is uh, that they are coming for. The New York State Stranding Hotline may give you some instructions. You will also be called back by someone from AMCs or the New York Marine Rescue Center and they will give you uh, ask you for further information and give you further instructions on how to help that turtle. They may ask you how close is that turtle to washing back into the water because you definitely don't want to put the turtle back in the water because it's only going to get colder and most likely die. So if you are walking the beach say at um, low tide and you find a turtle when the tides coming back in and that turtle is in danger of washing back out, you may be asked to move that turtle further up the beach and they'll provide you instructions. That's where your gloves come in handy. The most important thing is that you want to keep your hands and fingers away from the head because even if a turtle looks dead or it's not moving and it feels cold, we're gonna assume that it's alive until proven otherwise and they can still bite. Um, you don't want to restrict their flippers from moving um, because their lungs are just under their shells in the back. Uh, if they're upside down, you will definitely be asked to flip that turtle back on its plastron or belly. Um, another important thing to do is sheltering the animal from the wind without covering it up. Um, so you could take the debris you find in the rack line, like that straw and make a little barrier between that turtle and the wind. We have found in the past sea turtles that have had the windward side of their bodies frozen solid because they were exposed and just getting colder every minute. Um, you want to record the location, time of encounter, the air and water temperatures. They may ask you to wait for responders. Um, they may say, are you able to wait with this animal until a responder can get to you? And it could be 45 minutes to an hour because both AMCs and the Atlantic Marine Rescue Center are out on the East End. Um, and as you saw from the map earlier, Turtles can strand on all places in the shoreline. Um, if you can wait, that's great because then you are the best landmark to help that rescuer find that turtle. If you can't wait, it's understandable. So maybe if there's a big stick, you could plunge into the sand to make a landmark. Um, this is when it's helpful if you've given them your exact latitude and longitude, they can find it. Um, if you cannot wait, it's great to clearly mark the location so that the responders can easily locate the animal. You may also be asked to transport the animal, so you want to record the location, the time of encounter, the air and water temperature, if not already done. Um, you'll transport them with their belly, their plastron facing downwards. You want to keep them level, uh, keep the head away from you, because uh, like I said before, they can still bite. Watch out for movement of their flippers. They can be strong. They can hit your hands while they're carried. Um, and keep their flippers free to move and record any activity. If you are asked to transport a sea turtle in your car, you, what you absolutely do not want to do is get that turtle in the car and blast the heat. Um, when the sea turtle is brought in to the rehab hospital, it is warmed up very slowly. Heating up the turtle quickly 
can cause it to go into shock and die. So unfortunately, you got to open up the windows and keep the heat down. And at least that turtle will be sheltered from the wind while you're transporting it. Ellie, if I could just say, it is really important just to note that while we are giving you some suggestions on best practices, if you are asked to um, handle an animal, we uh, never want to advise anyone to handle an animal unless you are prior, you're asked to do so by a uh, trained responder. Yes. Um, in all other circumstances, you want to stay at least 150 feet away from any marine wildlife you see for your protection, for their protection. It's also the law. Um, but during cold sun season, if you receive specific instructions, otherwise, that is when the only time that you can handle an animal. Um, here's just a couple resources. Before you walk, you want to check the tides. There's several websites you can do that. You just check the tides for your nearest body of water to the beach you're going to be walking. You can check the water temperature. Um, it's also, see, you can use one of these specific websites, seatemperature.info or seatemperatures.net. You can also just Google it, um, and that will can get you to the right website. When you're at the beach, and if you find a sea turtle, you can mark your latitude and longitude using your Maps app. Or if you have an iPhone, I uh, think it's also in the Compass app, it gives you your, your latitude and longitude, and your weather app can give you the wind speed and direction. Also, when you're out there, you'll feel which way the wind is blowing, and you want to make sure that that is where you are sheltering that sea turtle. So once the sea turtle has been called in, brought in for rehabilitation, um, it still has a long road ahead of it at a critical care facility, and AMCs is one of those critical care facilities so uh in new york the new york marine rescue center responds to all sea turtles during cold sun season because as i said before we assume an animal is alive as long as it has a head um, and that's the best way to make sure it gets consistent rehabilitative care um so we have for the past three years for the past three cold sun seasons had sea turtles in our facility where did they come from um, in late November and early December, our stranding partners in New England were expressing a need for help because they had so many cold sun sea turtles. They can get up to about like 3,000 in a single season, um, too many for them to handle. So we spun up our facility in early December of 2020 to help meet that need for facilities that could rehabilitate cold sun sea turtles. And we are currently gearing up for another batch this winter. We have three 1,000 gallon tanks along with smaller swim tanks uh, that when the sea turtles come in, we make them do a swim test before they're put in the big tank. Each large tank can hold up to seven turtles for rehabilitation. It depends on size of the turtles as to how many turtles you can fit in the tank. Um, the past three seasons, we have had Kemp's Ridley sea turtles. So as you can imagine, uh, as Ali said before, they only get to about two feet long, and the ones that we have had have been pretty small, um, so we are able to fit around seven turtles in each tank. Um, they get to us via airplane. We work with an organization called Turtles Fly 2, uh, which is, includes pilots, private pilots, donating their planes, their resources, their time to help transport sea turtles up and down the East Coast between the locations where they are stranded and locations that re that rehabilitate them and then later on once they are um, healthy they also help transport those turtles to locations where they can be released um, this past november in 2022 we received 20 turtles from the new england aquarium as they had so many cold sun turtles they needed more help and space to rehabilitate them uh ali i think this is a picture of you doing uh testing the heart rate of a turtle with doppler radar um when they come in we take measurements of their length their size their length width um, their weight their body condition uh, we take their heart rate cold sun sea turtles their heart rate can get down to ali please correct me if i'm wrong i think it's about five beats per minute um, uh, yeah, we've we've had success rehabilitating animals that have had slower heartbeats than that, but about five or so per minute is um, is not good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, 
that is a slowed down sea turtle. Um, and so you want to warm them up very slowly. Um, we also take their blood work um, to get a full blood work to find out what health conditions they may be facing. As I said before, cold sunny makes them more susceptible to infection. Um, so we use blood work to determine that. We keep records of the sea turtles. They're given a number by their organization that pulled them off the beach. Then we also give them our own number and that's how we refer to them. And their numbers kind of become like their names. Although this year we are going to try naming our turtles. Um, we're looking for turtle names and themes. Um, but as you can see, uh, they come in looking pretty rough. Uh, here is a video we have of the turtles once they're feeling a bit better that I'm gonna play for you. Um, as I said before, they have to pass a swim test before they're put into the larger tanks. So these are the turtles once they're in the larger tanks. Maybe, here we go. As you can see, they propel themselves forward with their front flippers and then use their back flippers to steer, um, which is why we keep an eye out um, while they're in our care for their how they're swimming, um, if they're favoring any flippers, because that can be a first sign of infection um, or injury. They're very inquisitive and they're very food motivated. As we Ellie, did you, <laughs> yeah. Ellie, did you mention the numbers on the turtle shells? So the numbers on the turtle shells, they're given numbers by um, the organizations that pick them up off the beach and then we also give them numbers and that's how we refer to them. And we use those numbers in tracking, you know, referring to different health uh, concerns in each turtle. We also use it when feeding the turtles, um, which you'll see in a minute. This is just another slide of um, the turtle intake process. We also take their measurements, weight, length, width um, every month or so to see how they're healing, how they're re how they're growing um, and making sure that they're getting enough food. The food is their food intake is based off their weight, a percentage of their body weight. So it's important to adjust that as they grow and they need more food. Um, but yeah, we refer to them by their numbers. Um, and we have to repaint their shells uh, quite often as you know it's non toxic paint and it um, just tends to wear away. Um, but as I said, we use it when feeding so we feed them in pairs, um, we have cut pieces of food into either three, four or five gram pieces, and so when you throw a piece of food into the tank, you know how big that piece of food is and so then you can keep track of which turtle is eating which piece of food and the person throwing the food in calls that out to the recorder um so they would say who gets it 675 just got a five gram piece of shrimp and they would take a tally and then we would make sure that's how everybody is getting enough food um they we also keep track of if they bite each other because these turtles are solitary animals so as they start to feel better and get more energy, they can get a little bitey towards each other when going for food. Um, and unfortunately, uh, that can cause injury to the turtles. So we keep an eye out for that. Um, we try not to target feed them. Like we have these large forceps that we can use to feed them. Um, but as they all feel better and are all eating well, we try not to use that because we don't want to teach them to you know correlate humans with food um, in the future once they are ready for release uh, they're checked by a vet and they're deemed healthy enough for release we use turtle fly 2 to transport them to their release locations um, of the turtles we received last november we were able to rehabilitate 17 of them 
I believe we sent nine in the beginning of May down to North Carolina on via Turtle Supply 2 for release because the water up here just wasn't warm enough yet. Um, but they were healthy and they were ready to go. They were biting each other. And so it's always better to release them to the wild as soon as possible. Um, and then they were released from a beach. We then had a couple more in our care that needed a little more TLC. We released seven more from Jones Beach Energy and Nature Center in mid-July. And then our final turtle of last season, we released in September, the water was still warm enough, um, from Point Lookout Beach. And yeah, so the most important thing we want you guys to remember is that we are sharing our beaches, we are sharing our ocean with a wealth of wildlife, including these turtles, and it's important to help them when we can. Um, it's important to keep our beaches clean by taking your trash with you and any other debris you find on your journey. And please, if you didn't before, please do so now. Take down this New York State Stranding Hotline in your phone. Um, you having this number in your phone could be the difference between life and death for a sea turtle. I'm not being dramatic. Uh, the sooner a cold sun sea turtle is brought in for rehabilitation, the better chance they have. And if we have the opportunity to help them, we should definitely take it. Um, I think this QR code also is for our sightings website. If you see um, any wildlife from the beach, uh, like we've seen whales breaching at a lot of our beach cleanups, uh, you can use our sightings website to report your sighting of wild, wild animals. Um, I guess we want to hear about the healthy animals too. And I'm going to leave that up so that everybody can get that number. Um, and I guess we're ready for questions. Thank you so much, Ellie and Ali. That was great. Um, so folks, we have 15 minutes for questions. So please don't be shy. If you have any questions about turtles or cold stunning or anything uh, related to this topic, please feel free to drop it either in the chat or the Q&A. Um, so I think we have two questions right now. Um, one is what is the, the normal heartbeat? You mentioned that when they're you, not doing too hot, um they go down as as slow as five beats per minute or even lower um so what is their regular heartbeat that is a good question um and i had to phone a friend for that one so our uh i texted our um sea turtle coordinator kimberly durham during the talk and um she reminded me that sea turtle um heart rates kind of go along with the temperature of the water that they're in so generally um, when they're feeling well they their heart rate could be about 25 to 30 beats per minute depending on how warm the water is um, <clears throat> so as the water does cool down their heart rates slow as well um, now this is not a problem on a long on a short term basis for turtles because they do have the ability to sort of um, slow down their heart rate, especially if they're resting on the bottom, because obviously when they're underwater, they're not going to be breathing so they can conserve their oxygen while they're underwater. But for prolonged periods of time, um, a very slow heart rate would um, damage their system. Thank you, Allie. Um, another question um, sent earlier was, did you say that ingestion of marine debris was the number one threat to sea turtles living in the Northeast? or visiting the Northeast? Um, so that is a great question too. Um, unfortunately, in the past, uh, since 2017, the um, information gathered by our stranding responders it says that vessel strike is actually the leading cause of um, human-induced issues that sea turtles have. So uh, we have recorded uh, about 600 sea turtle strandings from 2017 through now, and over a hundred of them have had some evidence of vessel strike as contributing to their stranding. Um, so that is a big issue. But the, the main point is vessel strikes and marine debris are both human induced issues. And they're both issues that we as a community can do something about. 
So um, really important if you are a boater to be aware. So that's one of the reasons we talk a lot about sea turtles in our work um, in this area is to make sure that people even know that they're here and they should be watching out for sea turtles when they're in um, New York waters in the summertime. And also um, we have the ability to change our daily habits in a very slight way that won't affect us much, but will be uh, really important and a uh, positive change on the hat on the environment, including reducing your use of single use plastics um, and trying to make smart choices about the products that you purchase. I guess while we're on the subject, are there any do's or don'ts uh, that boaters should be aware of to help, you know, reduce chances of, of boat strikes? Um, really just going slow and, and watching out are the biggest, um, biggest things that you could do, especially in the shallower uh, water areas around marinas um, and popular fishing sites. Um, so sea turtles might be near the surface. Um, and one other thing to, to know about sea turtle if, if you do encounter a sea turtle, especially while you're fishing, it's really important not to try and just cut your line and let the sea turtle go. Because unfortunately, um, there is a chance that they've ingested a hook or some fishing um, gear. And so it's always better to call the New York State Stranding Hotline and get a response for that sea turtle. So some, so some sea turtles that are encountered by the recreational fishing community um, could definitely be released back into the water very quickly, uh, but without an exam to know if further damage has been done, that animal might still be suffering as it is released. Gotcha. Um, so we have another question. Do turtles continue to grow their whole lives? And I'll add to that question. Um, how old, more or less, are the little turtles we saw in that video of the tank? <laughs> Um, so I'll answer that question first. We see, especially in the um, cold stunning seasons in this area, a lot of juvenile turtles. And at the small kind of dinner plate size that those Kemp's releasey turtles in the video were, they're likely between two and five to seven years old. So they're pretty small. Um, <clears throat> most of the sea turtles in our that have come through our hospital um, have been less than 10 pounds they weigh less than 10 pounds and and one of our smallest sea turtles this last season was i think two and a half pounds when it was released so it was pretty small Aww. um yeah so um the sea turtles don't continue to grow bigger as uh, you know they do reach their maximum um length and kind of maintenance weight i guess we would call you would call it as um so they don't continue to grow like that, but they do um, have normal. So the hard shelled sea turtles, um, the top covering of their shells or, or scoots, those separations um, are made up of keratin. So they do actually shed their scoots and then get um, new scoots throughout their lifetime. Um, but once they're adults, they are pretty much full grown. Um, and also while we're on the topic, um, I'd, I'd like, to ask, so are turtles more susceptible or more likely to be cold stunned if, you know, the smaller they are? Yes, absolutely. Um, one of the reasons why we don't see a lot of leatherback sea turtles getting cold stunning, getting cold stunned is because they can regulate their body temperature to a degree or so. Um, and they are found in, in um, offshore habitats and slightly colder water than the other animals. Um, but as you know, the turtle, as the smaller turtles, they, um, they have a hard time regulate their, regulating their body temperature. So they are a lot more susceptible. We generally see the trend in cold stunning that the smaller animals um, wash up earlier in the season. And then towards the end of November and December, you'll start seeing larger loggerheads that are still in the area. Um, that's when they start to um, show up on our beaches as well. So it oh, takes them a little longer to succumb to cold stunning. Interesting. Um, so another question we got, do you ever worry that the turtles will become dependent on you for food? 
Um, so that definitely is an issue. And we do uh, try our best to, um, you know, maintain some distance while we're feeding the turtles, but they are marine reptiles. So they are not as easily imprinted on people as maybe mammals do. Um, so, and they're pretty instinctual. So we do feel that they um, return to their normal habits as um, after they're released. <laughs> Um, another question, does the ecosystem or local human communities receive some kind of benefit from turtles? Maybe they eat an animal or plant that is detrimental. Maybe they deter something from happening. Maybe they are a sign uh, the water is safe for humans. That is a very interesting question. Um, I can say that there's always a benefit to animals that are supposed to be in our waters and evidence shows that sea turtles have been in these waters at least for 40, for 40 years, but um, historically as well, um, because they're part of the ecosystem. So when you lose animals that are sort of higher up on the ecosystem chain, um, it, it kind of throws everything out of whack. Um, well, for instance, if there are, so we've been seeing more Atlantic green sea turtles in the stranding records in recent years, as opposed to um, in the late um, 2000s, early 2010-11. And um, because these animals are marine reptile or um, vegetarians, that may, may mean that there's more um, seagrass available in these areas, which is also a really good thing for the ecosystem because the seagrasses, the eelgrasses in the um, bay systems in the Baconic Bay and the Great South Bay um, and Long Island Sound are really great uh, habitat for small schooling fish as well. Um, so that is definitely a good thing. <laughs> the the one last thing I'll say about that is um, we have seen some benefits or there's been some research recently showing sort of benefits of e the ecosystem receives from top predators, um, how they move nutrients around the um, ecosystem itself and um, potentially are distributing different nutrients around um, the water column, through the water column, around the different areas. So as they migrate, they kind of distribute different nutrients in different places. So always a good thing. That's really interesting. Um, so another question, what were the bands around the turtle's flipper and does it grow with them? Ellie, did you want to take that or I could answer that as well? Um, this is this is going to be my first cold sunny season, so if you could answer that. <laughs> okay, sure, sorry. No, the bands that they, you saw on the sea turtles, um, in the video were put on by the responders. So um, they're part of an ID system to make sure if the numbers on their shells wash off, we still have an ID for them. Um, <clears throat> and they're actually, they're um, not very technical. They're zip ties with some plastic uh, foam on them um, and they don't grow with them. So if they do start getting tight on the animals, we'll um, take them off and replace them. And they actually don't, um, they don't get released with those either. So that's just an in-house way to make sure that we can monitor the animals. And as Ellie said, um, it's really important to be able to identify the different individuals because they all have different health needs. A lot of the animals will be on different medications and we wanna make sure that they're eating enough and that they're gaining weight at the right time. And that's how we'll be able to tell when they're able to be released as well. Um, so another question we got, do turtles have nerves in their shells? And to this one, I would tack on, what about green sea turtles versus leatherbacks? <laughs> Very good. Um, I don't know a lot about that, but I do know that the hard-shelled sea turtles' um, shells are definitely sensitive. And um, in their tanks, we have seen them rubbing kind of debris off of their shells and um, rubbing the top of their shells on different areas of the tank. Um, so. So there is some thoughts that they're they're they are sensitive or or do have sensation in their um in their shells, um, and but the other thing is interestingly enough they also do gather epibiota or um you know uh barnacles as they get older and um they do attach on the animal shells so um 
that doesn't seem to bother them. If you see a really, um, you know, an adult loggerhead, you'll definitely see a couple of barnacles hanging out with them. Um, so I don't see any other questions, but I have some questions. Um, so <laughs> do you, could you explain, uh, why we tend to see, uh, you know, this cold stunning happening in the Long Island Sound specifically? That is a really good question. Um, one that we're still trying to answer, but some of the prevalent theories include the Long Island Sound is a really great ecosystem for it's cold, for sea turtles in general, um, and especially the juvenile sea turtles that we tend to be seeing a lot of um, because there's a lot of basin estuaries off the Long Island Sound um, that have great food areas for them. Um, and the Long Island Sound and those basin estuaries are also a great uh, habitat for these animals to um, find protection from predators because we don't see a lot of big predators um, in those areas larger sharks that might be interested in eating these turtles. Um, so it's a really great habitat, but it also stays a little bit warmer than the rest of the um, area. The ocean water cools down um, pretty a lot quicker than the Long Island Sound. So we have thought that um, the, these sea turtles may not be getting the environmental cues that they need from Long Island Sound to say, hey, it's time to go. Um, so as they are moving, Maybe they're, you know, hanging out in Northport and um, as they're moving east along Long Island, coming around the sound and getting into the ocean, um, they might be encountering those colder waters and getting cold sun as they're trying to migrate. Um, and we also um, have some thoughts that some of the sea turtles that are migrating from the Massachusetts area might be getting drawn into Long Island Sound with the currents that come um, out from the ocean. So maybe they're getting drawn into the Long Island Sound and are already compromised and potentially starting to get cold stunned. Um, and that's why they are washing up on our beaches. So um, it's a good thing that there's turtles in the area because it means the habitat can support them. Um, but definitely really important that we have um, our, our communities walking our beaches. Um, so one of the great things about our community is that we have had a lot of effort put forth on the North Shore um, and Long Island Sound beaches. Um, so, but we have also seen sea turtles returning and um, in greater numbers on the South Shore. So just because that's not a known hotspot at the moment doesn't mean that turtles aren't stranding in that area. So still very important to walk your beaches wherever you are on Long Island, even if it's not a Long Island Sound Beach, because you never know um, what you might find. Yeah, definitely. Um, and one one last thing I'll ask is, so um, is it useful if, if a person goes out to a walk, you know, to a beach and does a walk and kind of pays attention and sees nothing? would that still be good for them to report to you where they went and, you know, when they went and that they saw nothing or do you know? Yeah, absolutely. And um, we, we do have some um, volunteers who are dedicated to cold sun walking and they have scheduled themselves to walk a certain beach at a certain time of the day. Maybe they walk Sunken Meadow State Beach every Monday from three to five or something like that. Um, if we can get that information ahead of time, then we can help make sure that there is distribution of um, cold sun patrollers along the really busy beaches. And um, we like to know the effort too. So um, a lot of times, you know, people think that because they saw nothing, then their time was wasted. But that's definitely not true. If at least we know um, for certain, if you report that you walked this beach at this time, then there were no cold sun sea turtles there. We might also be able to correlate that with if there was a turtle found the next day at that beach, at least we know it wasn't there um, for 24 hours or 48 hours or um, a long time. So it's always helpful to let us know what you're, um, when you're walking, uh, if you know ahead of time, or at least that you did walk. And you can always email us um, at, and I can type a message here. You can email um, at volunteers at amcs.org with any of your reports. Um, and we also would like to know um, 
you know, if you did find a, a sea turtle on your walk, um, that would be helpful too. Definitely. All right, folks. Now you know who to reach out to if you want to schedule uh, a beach cleanup or not a beach cleanup. Uh, uh, if you are planning on doing a turtle walk and you want to reach out to Ellie and Allie and let them know, it, it's really helpful. Um, but with that, thank you everyone uh, for joining us. Thank you so much to Allie and to Ellie for this great presentation. And um, like I said, they'll be uh, at Sunken Meadow State Park this Saturday from one to three, and they'll be doing a turtle walk and a beach cleanup. So everyone is welcome to come. Um, thank you cool. so much. And have a great night, everyone. Thank you, Jimena, and uh, the team for inviting us here. And thank you for everybody who listened to our presentation. We hope that we see you on the beach soon. Thank you. Bye. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks a lot.